Hey everybody, welcome to uh, this Strong Valley Mid-Quarter Roundtable. We're quite a ways through 2023 and uh, got a lot to talk about, quite a lot has happened. Maybe more uh, what hasn't happened, but uh, I think we got some good stuff today. It's, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we normally kick it off uh, with just what the market's done and kind of roll into it. So Kyle, you want to uh, give us a little details on the market? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all pretty surprised, right? Uh, looking through the indexes this year and how the markets performed. I think most of our predictions were that it was going to be a sideways or flat first half of the year and maybe some back end rally here. So a little quick update, you know, the S&P 500 is up roughly around 15% for the year coming through the middle here of August. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about it here in a second that that's really driven by a handful of stocks, but uh, Dow's up about 6%. And uh, the NASDAQ, which is the tech heavy, which has really been driving these markets since the AI, AI talk started earlier this year, is up close to 30%. Um, our bonds are flat for the year, but uh, I guess that's a win compared to last year. So we'll take it. And yields are definitely higher, too. And commodities are down about 5% for the year. But to kind of put that in perspective a little bit, is we, we get caught, on the, uh, caught up on the six, eight months of this year so far. But if we expand that to just even 12 months, uh, you know, the Dow that's, you know, the S&P is up only about 4% instead of 15. So a lot of that's been driven the last six, eight months of this year. And kind of the things I want to highlight is it, not all things are equal. Tech heavy has been really what's driving these markets. And you have a slide here showing that the S&P 500 for one is everybody talks about, you know, it's the 500 largest stocks and it's, you know, it's a good, you know, measurement of the economy and the markets and everybody's, you know, benchmark, if you will. But if we look at this slide here, it's showing that there's seven stocks, NVIDIA, Facebook or Meta, Tesla, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google. Uh, those are the ones that are driving the returns. And so those are the seven stocks out of 500 that are responsible for roughly 70 percent of the entire return in the S&P this year. And all those are being driven a lot by the the push and the talk of artificial intelligence or AI that started a handful of months ago. And we kind of did a little another slide here on the seven stocks. If we actually just pulled them out of the S&P 500 and what that looks like for people. And so what you see here on this red line is the performance of those seven stocks cumulative. They're up roughly 58% through the end of June. Uh, you look at the S&P, like I said, up around 15%. But if you look at the S&P, that blue line without those seven stocks, so the remaining 493 stocks, it's roughly 4%. And so that's just the crazy thing is that you see these indexes that are up so high, yet it's really just seven stocks that are actually about 20, 23 percent of the weighting the entire S&P 500 index. And so, yeah, markets are up, but it's it's really driven by a, a handful of stocks in an area there. So it's been um, it's it's been a debate for some of us, too, because no matter what the markets do, you're always going to have a little bit of coulda, woulda, shoulda, whether it's stocks mm -hmm. or bonds or real estate. Um, you know, it's the life we live. And so it's, you know, um conversation that that I've had has been around these tech stocks and and you know it's been the coulda woulda shoulda moment but what I want to show here I've got a chart that shows what what the Nasdaq has done um here year to date and I'm comparing it essentially to those those other 493 stocks you know you had mentioned that it's up about four percent now inside of that value index this is comprised of a lot of the stocks that that many of our clients own when you look at an average let's say retiree or or someone who's five to ten years away from retirement they're not loaded up typically in in tech stocks and in rolling for the lotto tickets they've got names like procter and gamble and costco um dividend paying companies like that and that's represented in that in that orange line and so you many people will look at this chart and think gosh you know i missed something here uh, maybe we should be loading up why don't we have more than that um but, but then I what I'll do is, is I start to drag the line out a little bit further and it's going to show you really what what this index has done. So now when we go back here just over, I think my chart here is just going back a couple few years. What you're going to see here is that the majority of the climb in the in the Nasdaq year to date is just clawing back the dramatic losses that it had in the latter half of 22. And so now when you look over the last few years and I'll go back to the clients and say, OK, which one looks better now? Which ride would you rather be on the purple line or the orange line? Now it's an easier sell. Um, I think that's kind of the, when you look at the message here, that's, that's really the goal is, is long-term steady performance and, and tech stocks are fun right now, but, um, but anytime you can go up, you know, 30 to a hundred percent in some cases with some of these tech stocks, um, you know, it's fun when it goes up, but it's not fun when you drop 50 to 80% like they did last year too. You know, and, and Jason, a little bit goes of a back to kind of what I, we've said a number of times. You know, how many times over the last 20 years have you had calls or, or clients coming in and, you know, diversification doesn't work? You know, why do I have a diversified portfolio? 
and I got a slide here too that kind of highlights that is that there's different periods of time where, you know, yes, overexposure to a certain sector or index or anything could work. Uh, this again here is still just comparing the S&P 500 versus a, a, a diversified portfolio, uh, about, you know, 60, 40, if you will, but both U.S., international and, and bonds as well. And so going back like 2000, 2002, you know, S&P was down five, uh, 40%. Diversified portfolio here was down 15 Clients are still saying kind of, hey, but I lost money. Well, yeah, relative to the market, you guys had done well. And then just going through different time periods, you know, you look at, you know, when markets go up. So that, you know, 2009 to 2019, you know, 10 year span, you know, S&P was up almost 350 percent there. And the diversified portfolio was only up 220. So, again, not, not participating at 100 percent there. And kind of what I, it just brings into full circle here is that we look at this year and certain indexes that or tech heavy is really driving these markets and, and, and clients sometimes question, you know, why are we not participating? If the S&P is up 18 percent or 15 percent, you know, how come we're up eight, nine, 10, you know, whatever it may be. And so it just shows you that over time, diversification can help and does work. And that's kind of what it shows here in that bottom chart there when you look at the total return between the S&P and a diversified portfolio over, you know, that 20 year period. Uh, you know, it outperformed. And so uh, it does smooth that ride out. And Jason, I know you, you like to use that line as, you know, which which one of these paths or roads do you want to ride on? It's like a roller coaster and, and, and the, the sways and the ups and downs in it. And so if we can kind of the, smooth that line out over time, I think it's a little bit uh, better of a path for clients. The other a big, big point here in your chart is also assuming that these human beings did not alter their portfolio over the last 20 years when 100%. they were down 40 percent. And that's very, very rare. Um, yeah. You know, clients are less likely to alter their portfolio when they're up 30% because we don't need an explanation why we're making money. No one, I, I've got no calls this year where clients want, <laughs> I need a definitive answer. Why, why is my account up? But if it was down 5%, then the phone would be ringing, right? So we, we're only concerned why we're losing money. And so the other thing that a diversified portfolio does is it keeps you in for the long haul without having knee-jerk reactions. Uh, if you're if you're in a far more aggressive portfolio, whether it be all tech, all stock, or something like that, you you will be down plus or minus 15 to 20% every few years. And how likely, especially when your accounts get larger, you know, if you've got a million plus portfolio, how likely are you to be down $300,000 and do nothing? Yeah, uh, that's he'll spend most aren't. Spending most dollars aren't. instead of percent, right? That's right. So the, the only other thing, I mean, they hit pretty much hit it. The only other thing I'll say is, it, you know, they, we quote a lot year to date numbers um, because, you know, we live in a calendar year cycle. Most of our lives are revolve around a calendar year. But year to date is a totally arbitrary number. I mean, you're you're in the first month of the year. Year to date is one month. You're in now we're in the eighth month of the year. It's eight months. So um, quoting year to date, while it's while it is valid, it's a it's a different it's a different figure every time, a different time period. So when you look at it compared to uh, not that chart. When you look at it compared to one year, then you know you see a better you, you see a better picture because everyone forgets now that we're up you know a lot year to date on the Nasdaq that the last quarter or the last half of last year was really rough. And so you go from I don't know what the number Kyle quoted, but you know we're up twenty nine percent on the Nasdaq and the one year number, which only adds on a couple months, right? Another three and a half months, months, and we're up less than four percent. So the, that rolling one-year number is a constant number, right? One year is always one year. Year-to-date can be a, a slice in time that, that doesn't accurately depict the story. So just well, good to... The, good the to critical point with all that is, though, it, it, every client's plan sort of prescribes what their growth number is, that what they need to be able to meet their plan. So, we, you know, we kick around the numbers, and it's I, I enjoy talking about it, but the reality is for, for most of our folks they shouldn't need to try to earn 12% a year in order to make their plan work. That's just, Chris on that too, though. I mean, we, we focus on the indexes cause I mean, anyone who watches the news, they're in your face too. Um, yep. If you yep. read any type of publication, everyone's always talking about the markets, but, but beating a specific index should never be a goal. Um, not for us, not for a client. The, the goal is going to be the plan, what we're trying to do on cash flow, what the client needs, et cetera. I, I really joked with one client who was hammering on this point that said it's so important for him to beat the S&P. And, and I joked. I mean, I went extreme. I said, let's pretend the S&P 500 is down 10 years in a row. Uh, it's down 10 percent every year for a decade. And you only lost 8 percent every year for a decade. You yep. know, are you high fiving me? <laughs> and so you beat the yeah. market 10 years in a row, but you lost money 10 years in a row. So that's never the goal. The goal is to make sure you don't run out of money. Uh, and make sure you're able to live the life you want. You know, sometimes yep. sometimes you'll beat the index, sometimes you won't. But it's and, uh, like like it's a conversation, and that's about yeah. it. And like you mentioned earlier, the index never sells itself; it never sells out. If if the S and P is down forty percent, 
it's still the S&P and it just rides back when the market comes back. Um, you still know, 100% we, invested is what you're saying. 100% invested. There's, there's no yeah, behavioral we, finance. <laughs> there's no behavioral finance. We, I mean, we have real people with real money. And when, when you see those numbers tumble to a certain level, you just, you know, again, you, you like to think it's not going to happen. But at some point, people just say, that's enough. I can't take anymore. Where, again, you're dealing with an index. It, it doesn't have those feelings. So you just can't compare yourself to something that's perpetual when we're talking about finite time periods. Well, I think we, we hammered the, the indexes and the returns and what the markets have done year to date. And I know that it's one of those things we don't typically get as many calls or questions, like Jason said, on why the market's up. Yeah. Um, but it is something that we pay attention to. And some of the data points that we've talked about for the last year, year and a half has been inflation, Fed raising rates. Uh, sounds like at least now we got the uh, debt ceiling behind us. Uh, you know, all the other things that so have kind surprising. of run the line. Yeah, right. It, it, it got <laughs> that through. was one prediction we got right. Yeah, hey, right. <laughs> So, uh, you know, what's kind of the update? I know it kind of gets like, you know, repetitive here every month and every quarter that we're talking about inflation and Fed, but it's still really what's controlling a lot of these headlines right now. Uh, any updates on kind of what inflation's done this year and, and where we're at as well as the Fed and kind of what that looks like? Yeah, so I don't know if I have the chart for it, but basically inflation is just like, you know, looks like a, a pyramid. Um, it, it went all the way up to 9.1% basically just a year ago, a year and a month ago. And we were down to our lowest level in June um, since March of, of 2021, actually, which was down to 3%. It did tick up to 3.2 um, this, last, this last reading. I think they're expecting it to tick up just a little bit again in the next reading. So inflation-wise, we are, you know, we're, we're back. We're, we're not in, in what the, you know, Fed, their Fed target, which is, you know, 2% um, or even historical numbers. But we're we're well off uh, where we were, you know, a year ago with you know eight nine percent inflation. So, and again, like you, like Kyle mentioned, that is driving the market. That that, and then we'll talk about now the Fed funds rate, which you know at this point is probably probably topped out. Well, what, and what's pinning up inflation is is what we got rents that are still high, right? Uh, rent, you got energy kept, bouncing back. Energy has come back, even though most of the, most commodities are down. I think Kyle quoted those numbers earlier. Most commodities are down, but specifically, you know, fuel, uh, gasoline, oil, those things have um, have drifted back upward. And again, with I'm, I'm, we, we got to talk about it at some point, how, how I mean, I'm certainly surprised that the housing market has, uh, you know, price levels have stayed up. Deals are way down. Uh, new new applications for mortgages are way, way, way down. Interest rates are certainly up for those mortgages, but the pricing has stayed, um, you know, relatively high just because there's not a lot of supply. You no, know, who who wants to swap out a three and a half percent mortgage, move across town, and and take out a seven and a half percent mortgage? Not a lot of people yeah. are, are yeah. interested in doing that. So with inflated that's, prices, that's too. Inflation up. <laughs> inflated prices and higher interest. <laughs> no question. No so the question. one. So the one. And the one thing that's happened. I started to talk about a little bit. Fed funds. So. Um, the, the federal reserve recently raised, raised rates again in July, but at this point, you know, all market again, markets predict, you know, the future of these, these rates. And you can see at the 525 to 550 is where it's at now. And that's in basis points. So that's 5.25% to 5.5%. And the probabilities going forward are all the bluest is the highest probability. And then the yellow, um, you can see that there's not any rate increases priced into the market right now they're expecting rates to basically hold through call it you know march of yeah first quarter of, of 24 and then eventually see cuts again the farther out you get these are probabilities right and, and you're talking about estimates so the farther out you get from from current day obviously the less you know the less reliable they are because more can change but this is kind of where we're at so at this point, 5.25 to 5.5% 5, uh, 5 .5 seems like the terminal rate for the Fed. Things can change, but that's where, that's where the market sees it going forward. And that has, hey, a lot of, sorry, that has a lot of impact on markets where they're going fixed income, and we'll talk about that a little bit. You know, Adam, what I might pull up, um, see if I can grab this chart. It's a um, rate forecast chart. I was going to mention it later, but it's almost the exact same information you just discussed, but it shows it in a visual. Okay. Um, and uh, and, and it's, it's the same kind of story where we're basically see if we can grab this. If not, we'll pull it up later. But it's the same message. It's uh, it's talking about where rates rates will be down a year from now. And, it, and the conversations come up too when we look at m why are money markets paying more than a 10 year bond. Um, and that's really on that expectation that that rates are coming down. There we go. Got the chart. We made so it. 
so this is uh, um, this is forecasting. So for anyone that, that's watching right now, you can see that, that expectations and like Adam said, subject to change. But right now, rates may go a little bit higher, but for the most part, we've plateaued. And we'll probably hang around this level for, for probably a year, maybe a little less, um, but, but north of five for pro probably a year. And then depend upon the state of the economy, recession or otherwise, um, is what we might see when we might see rate cuts. You, you know, and Jason, that was something that we were talking about is, you know, for the last year is, okay, well, when are they going to pause rates? When is that going to stop? And then eventually, we, we even talked about potentially earlier this year, we were talking about maybe even a rate cut at some point in the fourth quarter. And obviously, it's it's data driven, and the data hasn't warranted, and the Fed hasn't made any decisions here. But I, I do have a chart that shows historically, you know, clients say, okay, well, rates have been high, that's great. But, you know, when are they going to start coming down? And they say about historical average is around 10 and a half months from the last rate hike to the, you know, essentially first rate cut. So we're still not there. We had that pause, you know, two months ago and then a hike here again in uh, July. So um, we'll, we'll see if that was the last hike like we're kind of looking at right now and then potentially anywhere in that 10 and a half month range, um, which kind of is in line with what the forecasters are showing on those graphs and those charts is, you know, like I said, almost a year from now. So, yep. And we're going to hit well, on yeah. this. The pub publishers, publishers of all the the data, got to be careful too, because what one thing they need to move before they really pause or even back interest rates up a little bit is they need um, unemployment rate to go up, and politically nobody wants the unemployment rate to go up, right? Right so before an election, that, that makes that makes it that makes it difficult uh, difficult for the people who need to publish the data, um, you know, to to not go back and reformulate it. And, and redefine, well, well, here's how we're going to, I mean, they, they've done it a couple of times with inflation and done it a couple of times with, uh, with unemployment. And so, um, and, and recession, that was sort of the, the big glaring one last year. Remember uh, Well, it, it's two quarters. Well, maybe it's two quarters plus another quarter. So th th they got to be careful there too. Yeah. And then, I mean, let's just talk real quick about uh, money market and how that relates. So, you know, and this is a double-edged sword, and we're going to talk about this a little bit today. So money market yields is approximately 5%. In fact, in some cases, getting over 5%. And uh, even shorter-term T-bills, which are you know, you're locking in to, to three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, are uh, yielding north of 5%, in some cases, you know, mid-fives. So that's a, it's a very comfortable place for people. I mean, if you can lock in you know, 5%, that's, that's a fairly good return for where a lot of people uh, need to be with their, with their plan. But we want to talk a little bit about, and this is the, the first slide, a little bit about uh, fixed income and, and, and money market and how that works. So uh, short-term rates are just that. They're short-term. Um, they're nice while they last, but they, but they fluctuate. Um, they fluctuate with current rates. And, and like we just talked about a little bit with the Fed, that we're probably topped out on interest rates. So there's probably not a lot more room to raise interest rates, meaning that money market and you know, uh, short-term T-bills and stuff is not going to go much higher. Most people would be fine with that, getting 5%. The problem is it's eventually going to go lower. And that last chart, go ahead and put that up again. That last chart just shows how bond returns have fared after the last interest rate hike. That's figure one on the left. So that's kind of what we're talking about now, that we may be near the last interest rate hike. And you can see, on average, over various rate hiking cycles, that's a small print at the bottom, all the way back to 1983, 84, 88, 89, lots of different cycles, that bonds on average, corporates, the bond index, treasuries, are basically double the returns of cash. And the reason for that is that as rates keep coming down, bonds bond prices go up where cash rates you know continue to go down so um it, it's a case for it, it's not a case maybe for shifting all your cash into bonds for, for people who have balanced portfolios you know bonds will benefit from eventual rate cuts and cash will not so um cash feels great right now but it's a it, it's sort of a short-term solution and most of our clients have a much longer time horizon than you know 12 months uh, to, to 24 months so that's uh it's something to take into take into account you know adam that's something that I, i've been talking about a lot lately is you know you know fixed income in general was driving point of a lot of our conversations with client meetings last year because of how poorly it performed and so the case was okay well wh why own bonds when i can get five percent potentially in a money market and, and so i think that hints out on as well as i have this slide here that shows you know once the fed fund rate is above interest rate or the inflation rate and how bonds have historically performed and so this shows here you know with the fed rate now back uh, through July here at 5.3%. Again, it's at that range of 5.25 to 5.5, but that's just kind of where it's at right now at 5.3. 
uh, and inflation was down around 2.3, uh, or excuse me, 3%, which is a, a net of 2.3. So you can see that the Fed funds rate is higher than inflation. And all that means is historically we see here is how money market short-term bonds and core bonds have performed. So I know a lot of us have talked about shortening duration and money market during this rising rate environment we've been in for the last year and a half. But the, the key too is trying to manage that in a way that when things do shift, that we are participating in the recovery of the fixed income market. And so a little silver lining that maybe there's going to be some some upside in, in principle, not just the appreciation and, and yield we've gotten here uh, in our, our core bonds here uh, in the next few years. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, last thing that was, I'll say on is, uh, I mean, cash is cash, right? And, and you need cash, and it's great to get to get paid on cash. I think we're just making the case for it's not appropriate to, to change your, your long-term plan, your long-term time horizon, and jump for the, the, you know, the short-term solution. I mean, again, you know, this is a, this is a great place to be. Um, I don't know where cash will be in, in 36 months. Um, you know, right now it's at 5%. But fixed income generally fares well. Again, it's had a rough ride because of rising rates, but this is when it kind of gets its gets its steam back as you're, you know, as, as Kyle just pointed out, where inflation is below the Fed funds rate, Fed funds rates topped out, and eventually probably to subside a little bit. Who knows how much, but, you know, it, as long as it stays or, or comes down, it bonds should do very well. You know, Adam, I think it's we, we've kind of talked about markets and volatility and, and, and money markets and rates and cash. You know, all this kind of brings to mind kind of the just big picture. Right. And, and, and we can sit here as, as advisors and, and talk about what we're seeing on the S&P and the inflation rate and interest rates and all that. But really, the, the behind the scenes work in the area that I know that we all focus on a lot is, is financial planning. Right. Um, it, it, as Jason mentioned earlier, it doesn't really matter what the S and P 500 does necessarily. It's relative to, you know, how you're doing in achieving your long-term goals and short-term goals and how we're structuring or, you know, or managing money according to those things. And so I know we all attack things from a plan first versus a, a allocation or a index or a stock or an investment and, uh, you know, things that are hard to visualize for clients in times of volatility or up down markets is, is the big picture. And, you know, one of the things that we've been using a little bit more here that we've always done, you know, it's just something we've done behind the scenes with less visibility for clients, but it's managing expectations kind of in the short term versus long term, you know, you know, today versus 25, 30 years from now. And I, I think you're going to talk about a little bit of you know, one of those um, the software that we're using here that, that kind of visualizes that and kind of, you know, shows that for clients, too. Yeah, so we so we basically started using a new piece of software. It's like Kyle mentioned, it's something that we've always done, but again, we see things a little bit differently than than the average client. Um, you know, we've always kind of done this within one portfolio where you have your more conservative stuff and maybe your your moderate stuff and your more aggressive stuff and they all play their own role and we know where to take money from at which times. But uh, recently, again, started using a new piece of software that actually helps break this out and, and helps clients to visualize exactly what's happening. And I think more than anything, um, it's intuitive and it, and it gives good peace of mind. So it, it's basically time segmentation. It's a time segmentation strategy. The, the software is, is income conductor. We call it the lifetime income model. And um, if you want to put up the, the chart, just a time segmentation chart, and we'll just kind of, again, this is just designed to you know show how it works. Um, you basically break it into five year five year tranches. So you can see at the bottom the time horizon is five years, then then ten years, then fifteen, then twenty, and then twenty five. And the idea is you put your most conservative cat call it cash or cash alternatives in the first bucket, and then each subsequent bucket gets progressively a little bit more risk. And and with risk comes reward, right? Nobody wants risk, but they want return. So in your first bucket, you have cash. So if the market goes down for five consecutive years, it affects your bucket not at all. When you get to the second bucket, hopefully that's appreciated, but conservatively, then you start to spin that bucket down and so on and so forth with the third, the fourth, and the fifth. So what it does, it, it allows clients to sort of put off or, or not panic with, with current market fluctuations because if you know you're not gonna need a certain bucket of money for you know until year 16 16 to 20 then you can be a little bit less less focused on what it's doing today or tomorrow or in the next month or year to date um because you have your conservative stuff that you're spending down and it's not fluctuating so it, it's a really it, it's a really neat piece of software um like i said each bucket uh, you know 
increases in risk um, just a little bit. I mean, you set your own target returns based on what a client needs and, and what the market will yield. Um, but it's, you said, it, it's something that clients have found valuable. You know, What's from you an mean? application standpoint, I'm sorry, Chris, no, no. Uh, but kind of like you said, Adam, it's stuff that we've all done behind the scenes, right? We always have pockets of money in a portfolio that are designed for short term needs, right? You're not, you know, overly aggressive with the money that's earmarked for today or, you know, tomorrow, it's, it's more of the long-term stuff. But what happens is, you know, when markets move, clients look at their statement, they look at their portfolio and they see that market movement and that's the emotional side. So it helps kind of put a piece that, you know, yes, the market or the total portfolio did move with the market, but if we look at each sleeve, so this is the money that you are set to spend based on your financial plan over the next five years, guess what? It didn't move. And so you're still okay. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we talk about all the time, it, it's it's staying the course and staying with a plan. And a lot of times clients will react or people react to negative news and negative markets and and hurt themselves by, by, by getting out. And so it's also a tool to put that visually for clients to understand that's part of the plan and, and the stuff that we're using today is, is, is not affected and hopefully get them to stay the course longer. All I was going to say is that we're always trying to get better at what we do, right? Always trying to improve. And this is just another way to, to illustrate something that is really intuitive for people. And you, 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 if you, if you, even if you, if you talk to younger people, they say, well, I, I know I can take more risk because I have a longer time frame, right? And, and people that are right at retirement's door are already retired. They know they can't take a ton of risk because they just don't have as much time. And all this does is break those time periods up a little bit more and, and uh, again, make it an easier to illustrate um, strategy. So longer term money, you can, relatively speaking, you should you should take more risk because you you have more, um, you know more more capacity to grow it and and uh, and and live off of other things in the meantime. So, and like we talk about, I, I don't think people understand. So I I feel like clients, people in general, understand the power of compounding when you're saving money, when you're saving and investing money and and preparing for the time when you're going to eventually use that money. They understand that hey, if I have more time, like the money will grow more, it'll get bigger. You know, this is this is all positive things, right? I'll have more to spend. But then when they click into this completely different phase, distribution phase, right? You're not adding any more money. Now you're actually taking it out. It, it completely, to me, their, their mindset changes. It's, it's not about growing the money anymore. Now it's just about spending it. You know, it's almost like I got it and I just can't let it go. Um, but when you see this tool and you see the power of compounding on those longer term buckets, you know, you may end up taking out many more times um, the amount of money and in income that you start it with because you're you're growing the money. If you put it all in cash and just basically say, you know, say you had a couple million dollars, you put it all in cash and you start spending it down, well, that's great. You got a couple million dollars and you spend it down, but you get very li very little growth out of that. So we, we tried to create just a uh, just a sample. Um, again, this is just for illustrative purposes. Um, this is a hypothetical. This is just another, th this here chart, just real quick, is another visual on how this works if you're not understanding. Again, first phase, the blue line going down as you're spinning it down, the other three buckets over time continuing to go up. And then you get to the second phase and you spin that one down. And then you go to the third phase, you spin that one down. So you can kind of see each, sub each of the buckets not being spent down is growing, hopefully, over time. That's, that's the idea. And then you get to that you get to that phase and you spend the money down do you want to go real quick to the uh sample uh model with the graph yeah so this this gives you a little bit of a visual on how the buckets work so again five five segments um i'll explain the legacy longevity a little bit but you got five segments one two three four and five um each or five years and you can see it's kind of like a uh like a wave that you know the yellow gets spent down first and then you get into the next segment and you spend down the purple uh, the next segment you spend on the orange, then the blue, and then eventually and finally um, the gray. So what the legacy part is, is if you have a plan and you need, you know, in this case, you know, clients with $3 million and they need $10,000 a month. Um, inflation, I think we have set at 3%. Uh, basically, that's the money that you're not planned to use over the life of the plan. So this is about a 30-year plan. And I want to say, we'll, we'll look in the next slide here in a second, but I want to say it's a couple hundred thousand dollars that you put in the legacy bucket because you're not planning to use that. 
Well, that's invested over time and that continues to grow. So in this particular example, again, a lot of assumptions. I think the segments are set at, you know, cash returns for the first one, which is like 2% and then 3% for segment two, uh, 4% for three, 5% for four and 6% for segment five. And then I think the legacy longevity bucket is set at like six and a half percent. So again, blended still very conservatively, but it's again, it's an example. So you have $3 million. Um, you go through this whole process. You can see at the bottom if everything goes exactly to plan. I, I want to say the income number is five point six million dollars. And again, this is with three percent inflation. So you take out many more times the amount of money that you put in, and then at the end of the day, because you have that legacy bucket that was continuing to grow and you never used it, you still have an additional two point two million dollars. Again, to be fair, this is not in today's dollars. This is inflated numbers, but. That's a pretty powerful, it's a, it's a pretty powerful visual to see that you can take $3 million, grow it to that point, spend all that income and still have money left over. You know, and, and Adam, I mean, this is like you said, it's a sample client and it's a sample scenario. And so the, the, the point of this visual is not to say these are the numbers and this is how this works. It's more to visualize the buckets and the idea of the more conservative investments to start and then more aggressive investments at the end, but also the importance of both, right? So the, the short term money is more conservative because we're spending that today. We don't, we, we need it. We can't afford right. it. We don't want to see it fluctuate, but we also like most people now retire 60, 65 and may live till 80, 85, 90. You have 30 plus years in retirement too. And so yeah. there is mm -hmm. buckets of your money that need to be invested to help outpace inflation and grow. And that shows, like you said before, that the, the power of the compounding and the importance of having different levels of, of risk, if you will, inside of uh, different parts of your money. I think the other important thing to note on this too, is these are, these are average return assumptions. So nobody's portfolio will look like this because if, if you have an aggressive, you know, say the, the segment five and the legacy longevity bucket, which is invested more aggressively, there are going to be periods where that bucket is, you know, down considerably because that's what you get with that type of risk. So it would never look like a straight line like this. But again, if you're take, talking averages over a long period of time, that's what you're trying to average out to. So it's just it's a visual on how it works. So we, we can flip over to the other slide real quick, um, the detail slide. And it just gives so it, it gives you the numbers just just again, you don't have to look at all this. It's just the top part where it shows basically each uh, the amount that needs to go into each segment for this plan to work. So you can see in the first segment, four hundred and thirty thousand dollars in the next segment, it's six hundred and fifteen. But the idea is over five years or five and a half years, that grows to seven twenty three. And then you start to spin that down. And then the next segment's five fifty three, segment three, and that grows over ten years. And it grows to, you know, eight hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars. Again, using these average return assumptions. So at the top you see the amount that each that goes into each segment. And if you add in all those segments, or sorry, add up all those segments, one, two, three, four, five, and the legacy the longevity, which is three hundred and forty thousand dollars, you get to that three million dollar number. So again, just an illustration for how this, you know, works in practice. We've always done this. Um, you know, we have conservative stuff, we have cash alternatives, we have moderate stuff, we have more aggressive stuff inside a portfolio. But to have portfolios split out into actual, you know, different accounts or different segments that clients can see, it's uh, I think it's gonna, you know, we've used it a little bit with clients already and it's been, you know, very, very well received. And I think it's something that'll become, you know, pretty standard going forward. Adam, I think for um, for the clients too, it's not that their investments would really look that different. Um, in fact, they probably wouldn't look different at all. It's almost kind of like a way to compartmentalize your emotions sure. with this, you know, because when 100%. we've got folks, you know, I just retired, uh, I can't take any risk, so let's just put everything in CDs. <laughs> and, but the client is, let's say, a very healthy 65 year old, and there's a very good chance they could live 30 years. And it's like, okay, wait, so even the money that you're not gonna touch till you're 90, that should also just be in CDs rolling for 30 years. Well, you know, so, I mean, it, it's a way to say, okay, this bucket of money, that you know, that's my, know, my money when I'm 85 years old. You know what the irony of that is? Like we talked about earlier, no 35 year old would say that. If you, if you were 35 and you had 30 years until you needed the money, they wouldn't yeah. do CDs. But if they're 65 and they're not going to need the money until 95, you know, in a 30 year plan, CDs are the answer. Again, it's just because a, a 35 year old can always go back to work, you know, and, <laughs> yeah, then, it, and it's that's the way it, and it's an emotional, but it's the, an emotional but the market, we get it. but but the market doesn't react based on how old you are or whether right. you can go back to work or not. 
There, it's it, it's, it's purely a, a risk and return game. So again, like like we were talking about earlier, it people think differently in an accumulation phase than they do in a distribution phase, and I think this really helps people get the right mindset in a distribution phase and and take an appropriate amount of risk and move their money forward and really make the best of the money they've saved. Well, appropriate amount of risk with the right money type, right? For sure. With yeah. with the specific um, amounts that are that are designated for those other buckets. So, yeah, no, I think it's super powerful um, and another tool that goes along with the plan. Yeah, like you said before, it's you know I feel like half of our job the day, throughout the day is just kind of being a psychologist through times, right? And it's it's keeping clients from doing things that are going to potentially hurt themselves in the long run, right? And so it's you know making sure clients have a plan and that we're adhering to it, but helping them adhere to it too. And so if if we can utilize software to help show and give clients that visual understanding of yes, we've already been doing this but this is what it actually looks like. So yes, you're looking at this pool of money and it's 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 down 10%, but of this pool, this is a mark that set aside that hasn't moved that you're spending right now. And so yeah. like you said, it's just, it's it's managing uh, client reactions to try to keep them on track with their plans and invested for the long haul, if you will. And at the end of the day, it's about helping people be successful. Yep. So whatever it takes to help them be successful. I mean, if they got to think about it a certain way, if it's got to be compartmentalized, that's why this tool is really cool because it if it helps people have more success we're all for it um and 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 i think it does and it, and it really really sends a, a powerful message when you you know when you look at it and visualize it so um questions so here's the top questions from clients we haven't had a lot of questions we don't get as many questions when the market's <laughs> going up uh i said jason got the why haven't i been in you know all NASDAQ, uh, you, you get that he here and there, but um, we, we kind of diffused out already that a balanced portfolio is, is probably where most of our clients need well, to be. Well, I mean, every year too, though, I mean, every year, just swap out NASDAQ for whatever's doing the best, you know? Uh, of course, last right. year, gosh, why did we have more energy, you know? Um, or the year before, <laughs> why didn't I own Bitcoin, you know? Or, I mean, you can always just swap <laughs> out whatever is the hot thing of the of the year, but you keep swinging for those lotto tickets. Uh, most of the time, you're going to miss them. Yeah. So are you guys, are, are you getting anything? Uh, I mean, I think the hottest button right now is is people are loving the interest rates that conservative investments are paying. It's the highest we've seen in plus or minus 15 years for, for cash, CDs, things like that. And so, especially for your more conservative investors that have been hurt in bonds over the last two years, stocks have not really saved the day over the last two years. They're thinking, my gosh, you know, why don't I just make this simple, put it all in T-bills and call it a day? And, and so that's that's been a question, but like we've addressed already, yeah, that might be a perfect solution for the next six months or the next nine months or or whatever. But all of our indicators are telling us that rates are not going to stay here. Rates are inevitably going to pull down. And then what markets are you going to be chasing at that point in time? Where will the bond market already have moved by the time you exit your T-bill? And are you going to be buying everything more expensive at that point? And so that that's, I don't know what views you guys have, if you guys are getting that same question, but that's that's the big one I get. Yeah, I, I think the cash question is always a, it's always a big one. But again, it, I think we addressed it earlier. It, it's it's time horizon, right? It's segmentation of money. You, if you need something for 12 to 24 months, cash is fantastic, you know, cash and cash alternatives. But if you really are, you know, trying to build a plan that's going to last, you know, years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, um, cash is not the long term solution. Any any analysis, any chart over any period of time will show you that cash is not a long-term solution. But it is great for, for short-term money, and, and it's nice that it's actually paying now. Well, that's kind of what we hinted at, too, with you know people living potentially 30 years in retirement. I mean, cash doesn't outpace inflation over time, no. right? So, <laughs> In fact, as, as high as the rates have been, uh, it just got above the inflation rate. Right. Because inflation has been high and it's finally come down. Inflation's at 3.2. We got cash at, at basically five now. So now you're you're earning a 1.8% real rate of return. Before, it, despite cash still being at, you know, call it four, four and a half percent, inflation was above that. You're actually still earning a negative rate of return, a negative real rate of return. So Yeah, but Adam, if positive. I have cash, I'm not, I don't lose money, right? Well, you have something I mean, to hold on to, but. Well, that, I mean, that's the hot. <laughs> Well, we, we finally right finally now. got an, in for the first time in a, in a long, long time. Finally, got an inflation like less than last year. You know, like why you don't really want to hold cash for a very long time because things go things have the ability to go up in price a lot quicker than 
than interest rates are. So that that's the conversation. I mean, because clients will look at their statement and it's got, you know, a couple hundred grand if, if they have it all in cash and they may look from one month to the other. And it's like, I didn't lose anything. You, you, but you, as we all understand, you lost the purchasing power. And so I've, I've yeah. told some clients, some clients where being in cash is a very safe way to lose money because mm -hmm. you don't actually see the visual, but, but you can't buy as much stuff and it will slowly erode over time. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, that, that's probably the main thing I said with the, with the market, the way it is. And, and with, yeah. and again, rates haven't been this high since probably before the financial crisis. Right. I mean, I can't remember you know, rates being 5% in, in forever. So um, it's a new phenomenon. It's it, it's a good thing, again, for short-term money, but but not a long-term solution. I think we've, we've beat that to death. Um, let's talk, so predictions. So uh, I said, I like to go back. Um, Jason, I think I just checked it the other day. So sideways market, you know, finishes positive, maybe a tech pullback. Uh, Kyle was kind of on the same camp, sideways market. Um, I didn't really predict on the market. I just said, I don't think we have any rate cuts in, in 2024 with some stickier inflation. And uh, Chris was just commenting on that and said, yeah, hopefully not because it signals too much damage and the market will be, that was three months ago, right? So looked up some numbers. Um, everything's up since then. Actually tech's up. It's not up quite as much as it was in the, in the first part of the year. Um, but again, like I said, it, we do this every day. We watch the market every day. We listen to this stuff. The fact that we're we're in it and listening to experts every day, and it's still very difficult to predict what's going to happen in three months, let alone you know, let alone the rest of the year, um, should show how difficult it is. But but we like to throw them out. So anything. Uh, so we got one more roundtable, mid November. Uh, where are we going to be, or what's going to change from from now to then, or at least maybe even through the end of the year? Uh, one rate hike. Okay. <laughs> um, housing market will not crash. Yeah, I think that's a pretty safe one. I, I think the inventory is, is so weak right now that that's going to hold. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, all this tech chasing, right? You know, by the time by the time everybody knows about it, by the time everybody wishes they had it, that's usually when you start to see a, at least a short term top. So it wouldn't surprise me if we see a little bit of a tech correction. I called it, um, you know, last quarter. We're starting to see a little bit of a softening right now, but I mean, yeah. the demand for tech is still really strong. Um, and, and I think that's kind of driven too by by interest rates not being at eight. I mean, they're still at five, which is high, but there was fears that they could have gone much, much higher. But with inflation coming down, um, tech is still kind of held up. So the markets have been rather resilient. No matter what we throw at it, I feel like eight months ago, we had like 15 irons in the fire and they're all awful. And yeah. the market is still holding up. There's less concern geopolitically right now that doesn't seem to be in the news that could easily throw throw a little wrench in the short term. But, you know, in the very, very long term, it won't matter. These are just kind of fun little 90 day predictions. You know, I guess one thing that we've talked about a little bit in the previous ones uh, that we haven't hit on a lot is the whole recession word. <laughs> we talked yeah, about it for two years. Have, this is the first time uh, I haven't mentioned recession. In, I thought we were going to make it through the whole one. Yeah. Sorry, I threw that out Jeez. there for you guys. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't. We didn't make it. <laughs> well, I, I just recall, I know that at the beginning of the year, one of my predictions was a potentially kind of that sideways market first half, maybe a small short recession at some point, second half of the year. Uh, nothing to react to or avoid. Essentially, it was going to be short in duration and short in depth. I think it's kind of the topics that are uh, talking points I've used. Um, I, I, I don't see a recession in the next, you know, three, four months. So I guess that was a prediction that was was wrong. Um, but it's still something to pay attention to with, you know, the amount of uh, spending that's still going on. Uh, eventually things are going to come to roost here. But uh, I guess the prediction is I don't think we'll officially go into re recession the next three or four months here through the end of the year. Uh, I think rates will start to pause. I think inflation is going to kind of get stuck around this, you know, 3%, 2% number. Uh, I don't think it's going to come down a whole lot. And like Chris hinted at too, it's it'll be interesting to watch kind of the labor market and, and, and employment numbers and see what that happens in, and what that looks like over the next three or four months here, especially with seasonal stuff like holidays and stuff coming up. So I'll go with uh, value over growth. I'll go with um, at least slightly lower, but m maybe maybe considerably lower um, 30 year mortgage rates in the next three months. Um, interesting. I think I think those two probably they actually go together. I would think, based on like I said, what, what Jason saying, they may have a tech correction uh, that's going to help value out. So, what um, about housing prices? I know in the last uh, little uh, mid uh, the monthly market matters. Jason talked about you know 
housing prices are less than 1% off their highs. Is, is there any pullback or correction anybody seeing in that in the next three, four, five months? That's what Jason was talking about. There's, there's just no supply. No supply. Yeah. Who, yeah, who, supply wants, who wants to swap out their three and a half for a seven and a half? Yep. Uh, well, and, and the one. second there's a rate cut, I mean, that's the thing with, with real estate right now. The second there's a rate cut, you've got a lot of pent up demand to demand. move, I bet. You know, yeah, it'll um, it'll come it'll come eventually, but um, you know, there's not a lot of volunteers right now. That's for sure. No. I think our, yeah. our our friends that do you know are there are involved in in mortgage origination. They'll tell you it's not you know there's not a lot of volume right now. Yeah, yeah. The only, I mean, the only thing I have is uh, is that I think we always forget that rate increases are uh, you know um, it take a while to take effect, and so and that was the steepest rate increase. I think I think in history, if, if, if I'm correct on that, I know it's much steeper than the, the previous ones we've had. And right. uh, it seems to have, you know, maybe helped out a little bit with inflation, but we see, you know, some of the some of the second and third order effects take a little bit longer to develop. And so I think we might have a little bit, uh, like I said, we've talked sideways market, you know, maybe it'll be down a little bit uh, in the back half of the year, because I think some of those things are starting to take hold. And you're reading the headlines with you know, companies missing earnings and, you know, employment and that type of stuff. Employment's still strong, but again, lagging indicator. And eventually these things, you know, uh, there's no, there's no free lunch, right? You eventually pay the piper for all the things you do. You know, it, it was fun to print money. It was fun to, you know, disrupt supply chains, keep people home, save everybody, which again, for better or for worse, it, it was a decision that was made, but there's no free lunch. So eventually that does result in inflation. We've already seen that. So now we've done this aggressive rate hike and cycle, and hey, it helps. You know, it helps in some areas. It'll probably hurt in other areas. And we just, I think, are just starting to come into that now. So, what well, we're not- seeing also, Adam. I mean, uh, credit cards just broke a trillion. And so, yep. I mean, granted, some of that is inflation, but um, but yeah, people are starting to run out of disposable income. Yep. And and they've maintained their lifestyle up until this point. But like you said, I mean, there's there's an ebb and flow market cycle. And so, I don't think it would shock anybody if things over the next six to nine months just slow down a little bit um doesn't mean crash or anything like that it just means slow and so you know life will go on collect our dividends collect our interest and stay diversified right yeah absolutely so hey hope you guys have enjoyed it um as always so reach out to us with any questions reach out to us personally hopefully we're reaching out to you personally as well but um if you have questions about the market um you can see sometimes we actually use them use them on the show and, and other people probably have the same questions. Uh, as always, you can follow us on, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, uh, YouTube channel, uh, our website's probably the best, best resource with, with lots of material there at strongvalley.com. And if you would share this, I mean, we, I said, we, I always say this, but we enjoy doing this. Um, you know, we get a good laugh out of it. It takes a little bit of work to prepare, but, um, but it is fun to do and, and share it with someone that, that you think might benefit or at least can laugh at us a little bit. And, uh, you know, but I think it, it, it gives a good insight into, into what we're doing and, and, and what we do on a daily basis and kind of how we're thinking about things and, and hopefully gives you a little bit of peace of mind too. But we appreciate your time, Chris. Jason, did we just get some new hats and shirts in? If people, <laughs> if, if people need something fresh for the, uh, for the fall. Yeah, yeah, if you, if you, you, know, if you do strong valley well. swag. Yeah. So listen, everybody listening. So Chris and Jason are the gear guys, and they keep us fully stocked with hats, <laughs> shirts, all kinds of stuff. So uh, when you come into the office, uh, look to your left. We have a whole gear rack, and that's for clients. And we're happy to we're happy to have you wear it and, and promote the you know promote strong valley. No, well, and if you don't if you don't live in town either, just yep. uh, email us your size. And, Absolutely, uh, we'll we'll get you out some gear. I'll throw one last little plug in too, guys, is it, we spent some time on that income model. Uh, if there's anybody that was watching this, either existing client or, you know, not a client that is interested in seeing how that actually works and how it might work for them or apply to them, uh, reach out to us. We're happy to kind of walk you through the, the, the program and actually kind of, you know, build one out for you uh, in conjunction with your financial plan. So, Absolutely. Well, thanks for the time, everybody. Appreciate it. We'll be back with uh, Monthly Market Matters next week. And like I said, one more roundtable for the year and see how we finish next up month. 23. Oh, sorry. Next next month, next month not next yeah. year. And then uh, one more roundtable in November and finish up 23. Thanks, everybody. Take care. See ya. Yeah.